2017, I think for the first time in American history, scientists are actually marching in the streets, right? Like scientists are actually um, banding together on the streets, demanding to be taken seriously. Um, and uh, which by the way, they should do and they have, uh, it's not just that they have every right to do it, it's important that they do that. But the fact that that's happening is uh, the evidence of the broader failure of their collective ability to be understood as part of culture um, for, for their mandates and priorities and let alone their knowledge, just their mandates and priorities for those to be um, uh, culturally absorbed uh, and, uh, and given the appropriate weight by a nation and a world that are totally dependent on them, you know, in, in, in concrete ways. And um, so if you look at the, the march as the noble attempt to compensate in a way for the lack of cultural currency, I guess one of the questions is, you know, why, why is there a deficit in the first place? And I think there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, and one aspect of it is, is that real proper science, very conscientious, thoughtful, responsible science uh, is, will always be a bad narrative um, because narratives sort of um, stories are basically a form of compressing information uh, and transmitting information from human to human um, in a way that it can actually enter the brain. And it relies on being able to say yes, definitely, or fuck no, or never, or always, or certainly. And those are not good science words. You know, science words are, you know, 97% probable. Uh, you know, science words are, you know, um, uh, you know, n number of uh, scientists agreed with, uh, et cetera. Um, or it works n percent of the time. Um, true, responsible, deliberate science is always dubious. That is, that's, that's why it works, right? Science works because it is always questioning itself. Um, uh, it is always reviewing one another. Um, uh, each scientist is looking to build on top of another scientist's work and sometimes negate another scientist's work. And that's, that's not because it's corrupt or because people make mistakes, it's because we're always learning. But that's not how stories work. Stories wanna have an introduction and some exposition and a conclusion. And th that's not, it's not really exactly what science does. Science just moves along. You know, it just moves along and we discover things and then we discover it's not exactly what we thought. It's more like this than it's like this. And it turns out that all these 99 things were right, but this one thing was wrong. And that, you know, that's, a, that's just a terrible story to tell. And the best example of this I know is um, one, of my, one of my great heroes, who just passed away not long, uh, was a scientist named Lynn Margulis, who's a, who's a scientist uh, who's, who's fundamental, she made a bunch of fundamental discoveries that I think are not, I think her name is not better known primarily because she's a woman uh, from a period in which uh, female scientists were rarely acknowledged broadly. Uh, but she was working, I would say, from about the 50s uh, through, let's say, the turn of the century. And um, among the many things that she did, besides uh, proposing endosymbiosis and uh, some important work with Carl, she, um, she also was one of the first people to really discover some of the very first really alarming trends around climate change. She was one of the people that first sort of pulled the alarm and say, um, these are nonlinear trends. Um, uh, we really need to address this quickly. She was doing this basically back in, I would say, let's say the 50s or the 60s, long before um, uh, most of the alarms had been pulled. And, um, and nobody listened to that. And uh, she was very, uh, she worked uh, with uh, James Lovelock uh, quite a bit. And Lovelock uh, built on her work and 
and sort of turned it into what he then called the Gaia hypothesis, right? The idea that the Earth is an organism, um, and uh, which is um, it's a useful idea. Um, uh, it you know it 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 reminds us of our place on it. Uh, it says that humans are not the center of it, and the stuff surrounds us, but rather quite the other way around. We're just you know uh, you know ants at a picnic, basically, um, and. Uh, and they had a they had a split, uh, Margulis and Lovelock. And Margulis was really critical of Lovelock because she pointed out, from a scientific perspective, the Earth is not an organism, and that the Gaia hypothesis is therefore bullshit. Which, from a scientific perspective, it is. The Earth is not an organism. There's all kinds of things about the way that you would define an organism that are not true about the planet. That's true. But towards the end of her life, she kind of recanted a little bit and said that, um, I'm paraphrasing poorly and, and, and sort of oversimplifying it, but um, you know, she, she kind of recanted a bit and said, um, it's true that what Lovelock was doing was not responsible science, but it may have done a much better job of communicating what we needed to communicate about what's happening with the climate than all of the data that I ever produced. And for that, uh, I, I think that I failed to recognize its utility. And that's a really good example to me of um, her criteria for that story were scientific criteria, and from a scientific perspective, it was a terrible story. But uh, I think that story, better told, could have done, could have worked a lot harder uh, to changing the way that we approach the environment. Uh, so, um, so the question is how scientists and their work can be communicated in a way that is persuasive, right? Because the things that are persuasive aren't the things that are true. Um, they're not the things that are carefully researched. The things that are persuasive have, um, have uh, communication aspects of, of certainty and authority and, um, uh, and, and repetition. Those aren't necessarily scientific tools. Um, you know, in fact, you know, good science doesn't repeat itself each time. Each time it, it is a little bit different. Each time it says, well, you know, we, it, we thought that the carbon load was this and it turns out it's this. And maybe sometimes it, it turns out it's a little higher, sometimes it's a little lower. But to a public that is looking for stories to have certainty to them, each time that happens, it feels like, well, you see these people don't know what they're doing. You know, or you see not all of them agree. But that's, that's really not how it should work, right? You know, the, 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 the lack of unanimity, the lack of certainty and so on is, is understood not as the greatest benefit of how science operates, but as some kind of vulnerability. And I don't think that, I don't think that we're gonna change the criteria among homo sapiens sapiens. I think we have to change the way science is communicated.